And um, I had a motorcycle. You guys got flies in here. Yeah, fly season. Yeah, we have one fly. His name is actually Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yeah, he's the first one. You are listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. We're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice, burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. Another week, another bomb hole. Welcome to the Bomb Hole presented by Solomon. Stony Buds, how you doing today? I'm good today, dog. So today is a special day. Even though this is a podcast that is mainly for snowboarders, a lot of snowboarders are lifelong skateboarders as well. And we happen to have the chief, Jamie Thomas, in the booth. Jamie, how you doing, dog? I'm good. I'm good. Happy to be here. Where are you coming in from? Uh, well, I live in San Diego and um, came in a couple of days ago. Uh, my daughter has um, a friend, and her family has a second home in Utah, and so they're doing virtual learning in Utah, and um, my daughter needed a chaperone, and the airline charged like 300 bucks to do it, so I was like, oh, who do I know in, a, in Salt Lake? So I called Jeremy and Jeremy Jones and uh, asked if I could hang with him for the weekend, so he obliged, so I chaperoned my daughter. Jeremy picked me up at the airport. Her friend picked her up. And then we're meeting at the airport on Monday and flying out. Perfect. How's your weekend with Jones been so far? It's been good. It's just yeah. been lots of like heavy conversations about life and I don't know what's what's going on in the world. It's been cool. perfect. I'm gonna have to hit him with some air horns because that's an OG right there. How do you know Jeremy Jones? <laughs> um, well, we first met um, back when I rode for Circa and Forum and Circa were in the same building, and so I met you know all the Forum guys around that time and. And then I, you know, learned that he and a couple of the other guys all skated, and JP and Devin, they were all skateboarders as well. And, you know, I, I didn't I didn't grow up knowing much about snow, snowboarding. So, um, you know, I heard that for them, like, they were, like, the thing. And, you know, they were nearby, and they were all coming up kind of in the same time that, like, me and Muska were coming up in skateboarding. And so I kind of learned all those names, you know, from, from being in the same building. And um, then got to watch a little bit of their skating and, you know, just kind of understanding that and having respect for them. And then I came to Salt Lake quite a few times for filming for video parts back in the day and, um, you know, would see stuff that, you know, he skated or hear about him jumping off of a roof into a parking lot or something at the university. So we just known each other for a really long time and weren't really that close. But every time our paths crossed, we were always like we were quick to connect and quick to get to like some cool conversations and you know I, I kind of like was trying to like work work trying to get some sunglass deal going back you know a couple of years ago and I called him for some advice because I knew that he was working with them and then we just kind of talking started talking and we're talking about life and all sorts of stuff and realized that later in our lives we had a lot of uh, commonalities and a lot of um, similarities in our careers and in the transitioning and you know, just kind of being an old dog and trying to <laughs> trying to transition into life. And it, it's not always easy. So it's cool to have somebody to relate to. And the fact that he was in some, you know, in snowboarding and being so different and removed from what I'm in, but us experiencing such similar things is, is pretty cool. It's so different, but yet so similar, huh? That's cool. Yeah, I think it's more like the arc <coughs> of a career or the arc of someone that's like obsessively dedicated to what they do, you know? And I think we always shared that. So therefore... Whenever we chatted, it was always quick to connect, you know. Yeah, he's a great human, huh? That, that's a common subject on this podcast, life after boarding. And it's a lot of people struggle, not that it ends, but, you know, at a certain point in time, you got to turn the page. And I was doing some research, and I was listening to you talk about uh, addictive personalities and the addictive personalities associated with, like, skating and snowboarding and, and whatnot kind of in order to get really good, you almost have to have an addictive personality and, and that achievement is a good thing, but there's also like some negative tones associated with that. And some, I mean, things. I would say absolutely more yeah. times than not, there's, there's a negative connotation. And I don't think that as a young kid, it was addiction. I think it was more obsession, you know? And then I think that usually addictive is not used like in a positive light you know, and I think it's appropriately used what you're talking about right now because it's not positive. You know, you, you know, you're obsessed with something that it's just such a part of your life and such a part of your identity that 
that obsession permeates your being everything. You're just thinking about, you know, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, how you're going to execute, what it's going to look like, you know, um, you know, and then it, when it becomes also your lifeline, how you make a living, um, all that kind of meshes together and you, you know, it's really hard to unpack, you know, and I feel like, I feel like there needs to be some type of like coach or someone that can help you through it. Cause usually you kind of got to hit the wall or eat some serious shit in order to like realize that you're on a dead end road. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting when I'm listening to you talk about that, I think a lot about how people, they put their self-worth a set, like they associate their self-worth with their tricks or their, their label as a pro snowboarder, or pro skateboarder, or, and then as, as it kind of comes kind of dwindling down their self-worth is tied into that and it's kind of interesting to see like realize that you know there's more to life than the fact that I did a back lip today or some shit yeah I mean when when what you do for a living and what you've done since you were a kid becomes your your the majority of your identity that's hard it's really hard because it's been your everything it's not just been like what you do when you are bored or when you got nervous energy or when you want to go and, you know, get outside. It's like what you do to feel productive, what you do to pay, you know, take care of your family and feed your family. It's like, it's what you do in every facet, like everything that comes up. It's like, you know, for me, skateboarding is the answer. Like, I feel like bummed skateboarding, go skateboarding. You know what I mean? Like I'm hyped, go skateboarding. You know, I feel lazy, go skateboarding. Like, it's just like, it's, it's the fill in the blank for everything for me for so long. And then, you know, and that's, that's really what the, the moral of the story is, is that that works until it doesn't. And then no longer does skateboarding for me filling in all those blanks, you know, and, and then your career, you're not producing like you used to produce, whether it be age or responsibility or you know, a host of reasons, injuries, you know, whatever. Um, or just you're burned out, you know. Um, you're not producing like you used to. And if you don't acknowledge that and kind of see that happening, or if I didn't, I mean, this is my story anyway, you can you can slide into some some really, like, you know, murky waters where, you know, for I was talking about this today with Jeremy, and it's like, we used to have these video parts, you know, he did them every year, but you know, for me, I did them like every other year for like the peak of my career. And then I went into like three or four year cycles. Cause I had business that I was trying to balance. Um, you know, and that's really what it comes down to is you can't skate as much because you got other responsibilities. So you're getting a trick, you know, 25% of the time of used to get tricks, you know, it's like a little bit more seldom. So the parts take longer to put out anyway, that's getting into the weeds, but, um, that, somewhat as you got older and as like skateboarding changed and kind of moved more towards social media. I mean, I know still people are still doing video parts and it's people are still making videos and that's a thing. And I try and do that with our company too, but it turns into like the daily post, like, and what's so fleeting about that is, is that the process of filming a video part in a year or two years, had you slow down and just enjoy the process and you didn't think about getting acknowledgement or accolades on a daily basis. You know, you got it, you know, when your interview dropped or when something would come out. Other than that, you're just with your friends and with your tight crew pushing yourselves. You know, you're not, someone's not telling you you're the best. You know what I mean? Like, that's just not happening. You're just like in that zone and you're just normal. You're just, you're just feeling like one of our crew. And we're pushing ourselves and you celebrate together, you know, you cry together, like whatever you, you got those ups and downs. But when social media becomes the way that you're connecting with your audience, that's a daily thing. That's a daily or, you know, two times a, every other day, sometimes some people a couple times a day. And now all those fans that followed you back in the day when you were waiting two years for your video parts, they can just chime, chime in right away and tell you how awesome you are. And really what they're telling you is how awesome you were. You know what I mean? And and you want to believe it like it's now and you take it like it's now, but they're they're really talking from that part of their lives with that you influenced when they were in the their youth, you know. They're 30 now. 
they were 15 or 16 and like you were so inspirational to them and they jam, they get onto their Insta on their Instagram and they see you doing a three flip on flat ground and they're telling you you're awesome. That's not that awesome. It's pretty cool, but it's not that awesome. But what they're really doing is telling you from their 15 year old self, how awesome you are. And then you're receiving it. Like I'm awesome today. I'm so damn awesome. And then that post wears off, you know, like it's been said, it's like cotton candy. It's fleeting. It's like sugar. You know, it's not sustainable. It wears off. And by the time it wears off, you're like, hit me again. Like, I got to get another post up there. I don't feel cool anymore, you know? And then you put another one up there and then, you know, and I, I've talked about this a few times, but you get addicted to that and, and you realize it's really unhealthy and it's really, it's non-productive, you know? It's just like, you're just chasing likes or affirmation or acknowledgement and you're aging so you're feeling, you know, potentially in your identity, you're feeling a little less valuable. Your checks don't get bigger as you get older. So you're feeling like, you know, you're feeling a bit marginalized because you don't have the ability to make it rain. You know, you don't have the ability just to have money coming in. You start to have this like financial insecurity that comes with the, the aging career and you're like, oh, Instagram will fix it. You know, if I do an Instagram post today, it'll fix it. And it'll fix it for a half an hour, you know. But when that, when that, you know, goes on, you're just left feeling emptier than ever. And, you know, and truthfully, when this is on the horizon is when it's time to, like, start, like, analyzing, like, where is this road leading? You know, when you start getting pay cuts consistently, like, every couple of years, after the second or third pay cut, you know, if you had a life coach or something that was like a, that knew the, that knew the game and that knew how it worked and they were like, yeah, it's not a good thing. Like when you do that, the reality is, is that this is phasing, this is phasing out. And you know, the healthiest thing that you can do is start setting your sight on new goals and new ideas of how to reinvent yourself and come up with other things that you can potentially nurture, nurture into your identity rather than letting this thing from 13 go all the way to 43. And that's my case. 30 years skateboarding was the constant. Relationships, trouble with law, school, family, whatever. People died, anything happened, skateboarding was always there. It was the constant. That was my identity. And, um, you know, it worked for a long time. And then all of a sudden didn't. Yeah. There's so much stuff there. Uh, the, the validation machine too of Instagram too, that it also listen to you talk about trusting the process or loving the process. You almost start attaching yourself to the outcome too. the outcome of the, Oh, this one, I didn't get as many likes. I didn't get the, I didn't get the dopamine hit and you, you fall out of love with the process. But then furthermore, what you're talking about, I love, um, that, that like, you never, it forces you to never grow up. Like, you know, I'm, a, I'm in my thirties. I'm on a trip with somebody who's 18. You don't ever have to like evolve as a human it just keeps you trapped. Like, yeah, it's know, like, the, your, it's like the Matthew McConaughey thing from, yeah, from straight, days to confuse. Up, it's yeah. the thing about high school girls. I get older, they stay the same mm -hmm. age. Yeah. And you're just stuck. Next thing you know, you're like, Oh shit, I'm, I'm fucking old. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. And I, and I've spoken about this in the past too. And when it really hit me was, is when I had teenage kids and I realized that my wife had not just three teenage kids to, to look after and encourage to pick up their stuff and handle their stuff. She had four. I was a teenager and I was so stuck in extended adolescence because I identified as a skateboarder more than I did as a husband and a father. And, and that's a, that's an issue in a marriage, you know, and it's a, it's a common issue too for men, you know, they don't want to grow up and, you know, and you growing up doesn't mean you have to be lame but responsible enough to see that, that this is no longer serving you and that it's time to like change lanes and start investing in other, you know, activities or practices that could potentially become your second career is a healthy thing to do, you know, and doing it early, doing it early, like maybe right after the peak of your career where there's not, everyone's not asking the world of you, but you're still in it and you're riding off of all the work you've just done. To start picking up something then and to start like identifying the skill set that has gotten you so far and how can you apply that in other ways in life, 
Like that's the great time to do it. You start investing in that. Then you start investing in relationships. You start investing in practices and, you know, and then in a perfect case scenario, your, your, you know, snow or skate career transitions out while that other, tra- that other career transitions up, you know, and it's a smooth transition, you know, but for lifers and people that are really dedicated to what they do and have had great success in it, it's much more difficult. And we don't have like, you know, I, I imagine Kobe, LeBron, Michael Jordan, all those guys, they don't, they don't necessarily have these issues. I know that athletes do, but the guys at that level, they have coaches and teams that are like walking them and talking them through the next stages and the next phases, you know, but we're out here doing it ourselves and like navigating our own path. And, you know, for Jeremy and I, a lot of it was absolutely doing it ourselves. Like there hasn't been someone ahead of you that has street skated and put out video parts for 20 years. You know, it's like, Nodis's career was like seven years long. You know, Gons is a, is a, a, an anomaly and a total Gons and Mullen are totally different dudes, but they still didn't even do it traditionally. Gons has disappeared for five years at a time. You know, Andy's had a fine art career and he's done all this other stuff, but I didn't do anything but this. You know, I, I, I was in business and business is cool and business can it can do well and it can also fail and you know, but I just stayed tunnel vision. It's gnarly. And it, it might sound like I have regrets. I don't because I'm so thankful to be right now with all the experience and all the understanding. And all I can do is just share that. Well, one thing for uh, our audience talking about that tunnel vision uh, that maybe they're not familiar with your whole path to get to where you're at, but I think it's fascinating your drive in the younger years. And I wanted to see if you could kind of paint a picture, run us through the cliff notes, I guess, of when you were young, coming up, living in San Fran, living in the streets, pursuing that that hunger, and you know to change gears. Yeah, I mean, for me, that's really simple. I grew up in Alabama. I lived in Florida for a year or two. Got into skating. I, my father was a nuclear engineer. Got a job in Florida for six, fifth and sixth grade. Got into skating. Moved back to Alabama culture shock. I was into punk rock music, skateboarding with my friends. They had skate night at the roller rink. Like to go like a, a Friday night was going and skating the, at the movie theater with all the chicks and they all thought skateboarding was cool. It was like I was living in a movie, like some like gleaming the cube movie or something. Moved to Alabama, maybe seven skateboarders out of 50,000 people in the small town and just tortured by all the rednecks that did not embrace skateboarding. So that was really, that was really rough. The reason I'm even talking about that is I'm painting the picture for how dismal for a creative, passionate skateboarder, not that I'm not trying to coin myself as creative, but you know, everybody else is dressed the exact same. I'm creative at a default. I have like long bangs and like big shorts and like, you know, this is the late eighties and everybody else has on a plaid shirt, khaki pants, and like these like boat high top mid top boat shoes. Like when I say everyone, like every male at the school wears that to school in junior high. Like their shirts are tucked in in junior high. That's and this is not a private school. They chose to tuck in their shirts on a regular basis in junior high. And that that's the culture I, I went to. High school was a little bit better. Got into you know hip hop and got into like I, I was you know um, more embraced by the black community because that creativity and like gear was seen as like swagger you know it was like I had my own style and they embraced it and I like hung out with a couple of skate kids a couple of metal heads and and then this crew of of um like hip hoppers that just we had clicked you know and public enemy and then there was gangster rap and all this stuff I just kind of really got into it but all in all I'm still a skateboarder and I'm like fish out of water you know it felt really like I had a small we had a small click and we we like all traveled like on the weekends to like 15 or 20 miles to go to this small town and hang out at a Hardee's and skate in the parking lot. Like that's what it was like. But anyway, you know, I'm reading thrashers the whole time. And I'm, I know that there's a world outside of this that is just nothing but skateboarding. There's a place that exists. And it's like, I'm dreaming about it. Like it's a fairy tale, you know? And, um, that was it. It was just like, I got to get there. Like, I'm just buying time here, you know? And I felt that from probably 15, 15, 16, 17, I'm buying time. You know, and 
told my mom, like, I, you know, as soon as I can, I'm out of here. And she's like, I know. You know, like she saw it the whole time. Like, I started traveling all around the southeast to Atlanta, to, like, Pensacola, Panama City Beach, Daytona, Orlando. Any Give me any reason to get in a car or a van or something and just get on some kind of road trip to escape that closed-minded culture in my small town of Alabama. I was in, you know. And um, I had a motorcycle. You guys got flies in here. Yeah, fly season. Yeah, we have one fly. His name's actually Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> yeah, he's the first one. The <laughs> first one to move in here. <laughs> yeah, he's a resident fly. <laughs> Sick. Well, hopefully he doesn't turn into a human you're and sit first, on me. I think you're the first guest to actually get that one. Yeah. <laughs> every other one, the young eighteen year old. Yeah, they don't know that. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, basically, I was buying time, and it's and when I say it's simple, it's simple as that is the life I have if I stay in Alabama. It's like, what do I get a job at a bank? Maybe work at the hospital, get into construction. Like that's where those roads lead. That's not bad. That's all cool. But like I was dreaming, man. I was on fire and I was like traveling around the Southeast. And if I won a contest, it was like one more, like one more like nod of affirmation. Like you can do this. You go to a bigger city, you can win a contest or you you show up and you can hang with anybody there, you know, as far as like you're at a rail or you're at stairs, you know, and it's not like we're trying to show each other up, but we're skating and you, you're pushing each other. And I was just like, I, I got to get out of here. You know, I got to go. I got to go to the West Coast. I got to go to California. And at the time, early 90s, 1992, San Francisco was it. And it was like me and my friends, we dreamed about it all summer in 92. It was like, we're moving to San Francisco and we're just going to live at Embarcadero. And we would tell people our plan and they're like, what? What kind of plan is that? And I'm like, the plan is, is that we are expecting that anything better that happens, like we'll be hyped. But like, if we plan on, I mean, it was still a bad plan. I was telling Jeremy today, (laughs) the reason it's a bad plan is I didn't even have a sleeping bag. I brought a comforter and a blanket (laughs) in San Francisco. I didn't know. I was like, California, like it's all sunny, you know? And I mean, I guess I could have, you couldn't have Googled it. But it was cold, right? Didn't you That's go what I'm saying. It was yeah. damn cold. San Fran. It yeah. was damn cold. But I didn't know that. I didn't, you know, I didn't, there's no, there's not a Google. You can't go pick what the weather is there, you know? And what would I go read an encyclopedia, watch a movie <laughs> or something? I don't know, man. I, you know, later when I got to San Francisco and I'm freezing my balls off, everyone's like, oh, you ever heard the Mark Twain quote, you know, quote, the, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. I'm <laughs> like, no, I haven't heard that. Thanks for telling me now. <laughs> Again, anyway, hindsight, good quote. Yeah. Hindsight. <laughs> anyway, the point of it all is, is that there was nothing for me in Alabama and I'd rather live on the streets of San Francisco temporarily. You know, we were there for three or four months, I think from August to around November. And that's a pretty, that's like the cold's coming in, you know, and it was cold sleeping outside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I had an Isuzu iMark, which is like a small little sedan. And I was such a skate nerd that I, all my videos and all my V all my oh, all my VHS tapes, my lamp, my phone, all my magazines that I'd had as a kid, they were all in my car. Those were absolute <laughs> necessities. <laughs> and so there was three of us that moved out, and it was just like there was only three like spots. You ever see a hoarder? You ever seen a hoarder's car where everything's piled up mm-hmm. around them? Mm-hmm. That's how our car was. But it was just our stuff. You know, we were moving for life. Mm-hmm. You know, and filled up the trunk. And filled up stuff around. We had a microwave, and um, you know, we're living real trife. Like, you know, I think we had three hundred bucks each, and um, we'd plug in the microwave and heat up hot dogs because you know everybody can eat for four bucks. That sounds fucking disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, microwave hot dogs. <laughs> but think about seventeen, seventeen. You're at the skate yeah. mecca of yeah, and and all you the we only talking no bun. We talking no, uh, we're talking a bun. Oh, okay, just curious. <laughs> yeah, just and ketchup can stay for a long time. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's you're t- free in those packets. Yeah, too. free in the packets. <laughs> so you got a bun, ketchup, and a hot dog. It's an easy meal. True, true. You know, and and it goes in a microwave and it works. Well. That uh, kind of ties into talking about Alabama Patreon question we have um, from Nanook the Gray is his name. <laughs> What's your favorite spot in Dotham, Alabama? I hope I pronounced that right. You did not. I didn't. I did figured I pronounced. <laughs> and, and do you fuck with Zach's? Um, Zach's is with a chicken place or something. It, I don't, it means nothing to me. I've never that, been to that, Alabama. That wasn't. I wasn't there when I was a kid. Um, um, Waffle House was our spot because it was open all night. 
you guys, uh, you have Waffle House? No, you don't. Uh, Phoenix. Phoenix. That's, they have them in Phoenix. Yeah. yeah, that's the closest. Like West is a Waffle House. Anyway, Waffle House was the spot because you could go there. Like you could skate all night and go there at two in the morning, and they don't hassle you. They're not judging you at Waffle House. Anyway, <laughs> Waffle House was our spot, not Zach's. If that's what he's talking about, is the chicken, that's the what chicken place. Um, Dothan is the name of the town. Dothan, Dothan. Alabama. Yeah. Um, favorite spot in Dothan. Um, there weren't really that many spots in Dothan. There was uh, um, Calvary Church. Um, was really cool. It was like a six there. It was a big set when we were young. Um, and then there was these uh, this place called Honeysuckle. It was like a it was a junior high school. It had the only slab of really smooth concrete, and it was it was a break area for the junior high school, and it was covered and shaded. So we would set up like launch ramps to the wall and drag them out out of our truck, you know, buddy's truck, drag them all there and set up like obstacles. And, you know, it's hot as hell and, and humid in, um, in Alabama. So we would, uh, we would go there and just set up a bunch of obstacles and it was super smooth ground and shaded, you know, so I'd say honeysuckle was our spot. It's amazing that you're able to decide you wanted to dedicate your life to skateboarding and that's what you were working with in Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't know I wanted to dedicate my life to it. I just knew that I didn't want to do everything else. True. You know what I mean? School sucked and I, I had no interest. You know, I'm I'm a parent now and I got teenagers and I'm I'm trying to encourage them to get good grades. And recently I was like, Man, I'm a hypocrite. I'm gonna I'm gonna get my transcript and see what my grades were like when I was a kid and I'm gonna go f- get my G D and finish school and I wanna take some college classes. That's a very ambitious plan. So you didn't finish high school? I didn't finish high school. No, I quit when I was 16. Um, I got, I'll, that's a bit long yeah. story, but I wasn't, I wasn't excelling in school and I was wasting time. And then I got stuck in some conflict where I was going to get suspended for the second time in a year. And I was going to have to repeat another year there. And I was just like, I'm not even pretending that I'm going to do that. You know, so yeah. I called my mom from the pay phone or from the office phone and was like, can you please come and sign me out? And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm out. I'm good. I'm like, you know, I, Jeff Goldblum beat it. Yeah. Goldblum's I feel like there's hot. more than normal. <laughs> yeah. There's a, he's Goldblum bought his fam. posse. Yeah. Whole fans here. <laughs> well, to run it back, uh, hearing you talk about those videos, um, you know, being a student of the game, uh, we're all kind of. I consider myself kind of a, a video nerd, mm. and we have a little section, and you got to throw the headphones on. All right, this. and this is what we call. It's a fan favorite. It's it's called name that video part. Name that video part. Name that video part is presented by the Do Tour. They support us. Make sure you go out and support them. Great event. You've probably done a do tour maybe in your day, or is that after the after No, the no. Okay. So, <laughs> for the record, Jamie's actually not a do tour alumni. Uh, but he is a student of the game. And uh, let me tell you something, Jamie. If you get this right, you get yourself what, buds? Little uh, prize pack. We got a little the prize pack. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm nervous. There's a lot at stake. Here we go. Well, actually, what's your confidence level, 1 through 10? It's pretty low. I feel like you're going to pull something like super random out because w- that's what I would do. I don't know. I want you to succeed. I feel so like I- he's pretty nice on this. Okay. All right, here we go. Do I stop you or just yeah, keep you, listening? That, if you it. know the answer. Um, I would say that is... Let me get the video. Chad Muska, Woo-hoo. for sure, Muska beats. And he's the artist. And I thought B.A. skated to a Muska beat song at some Ooh, point. You might have. Well, you got to name the video. <laughs> you can't get off the hot seat right now. Um, it's, a, it's a trans world video. I'm wrong. It's not a trans world video. It's a. It has to do with the board brand you rode for. Really? You need it again so you can get a little visual, visualization. It's a classic, dude. It's a straight <coughs> classic. 
the one. <laughs> You're not going to want to know why I don't know this. Is that Muska fulfill the dream? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So when that video came out, and this is terrible, Chad's a real good friend of mine. I wasn't a fan of the music. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't watch it? No. I, that's not it. That's not it. Oh, oh. I re-edited it to my own songs. Oh, that's kind of sick. <laughs> it's kind of sick, but it's kind of like it's kind of like a control freak. Like you're not liking their songs, so you're going to make your own version. Anyway, I didn't tell Chad for like 10 years cuz I felt like kind of bad. I felt bad that he would be bummed that I like didn't use his song. You'd spend my, all in, that time to put the whole two VCRs. I'm not gonna lie, that's like some psycho. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it that's is. like some borderline some serial killer, killer shit. <laughs> it like, is. Jesus. With two VCRs, especially nowadays, and, it would be so and, much easier. And in my in my version, Muska skates to Axis Bold as Love by Jimi Hendrix, and it was beautiful. <laughs> that sounds pretty awesome. I'm not gonna lie. Agree to disagree. I'm a Muska beats guy myself. I'm a fan. <laughs> you know, I had the miss. I had the mixtape. You know, I slapped it. The the over the shoulder crooked grind with the yeah. speaker. Come on, with the boombox. That's in Vancouver, Canada. You know, yeah, Musk is amazing, and and that whole era was amazing. And I love his beats, and I just love. I, there's, I pretty much love everything about the Muska. <laughs> I'm a fan, like to the bone. That makes two of us. Uh, so for I'm part, taking these headphones off so. <laughs> for part two, uh, we got um, basically. Uh, this is for the the fans, the listeners, the viewers. If you know. What song is this? Comment on Instagram as usual, and it's a skateboard song. Okay, I put my headphones. If back you on? don't like it, you don't if have you to participate. It, you don't have you to might though. know it, but you can't say it. It's for and, the listeners. And if you don't like the song that I chose, just you know what? Why don't you gripe about it in the comments? You know what I mean? You blow off some steam there. Okay, here we go. Okay, that concludes our section. Of in that video card presented by the D. All right, the chief. We're gonna get into some stuff <clears throat> that I'm excited to talk about. So I have a friend named Ollie who was very big on the slap message boards back in the day. Okay. Okay. And uh, I think you know he said he, you guys would chat on there a bunch, but he told me a story, and I don't know if this is a wives' tale or not. <laughs> But there was somebody that was maybe kind of talking shit, giving you a hard time, and then you basically met up with the guy. And can you want to tell that story? Is that true? Yeah, it's true. Okay, talk us through this. That's awesome. Well, in order to even un to understand that story <clears throat> and why I'm on the slap message boards in the first place, we'd have to back up a little bit, and I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. But one King of the Road, you're familiar with King of the Road, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One year on King of the Road. The hardest thing to find on King of the Road was a skatable backyard pool that street dudes could get down on and get all the tricks they needed in a backyard pool. It was, like, really hard to do. And <clears throat> we heard there was a backyard pool in Albany, New York. We, um, you know, my role and my job was the person to navigate how to get to places and how to find the things. It was like I was... I was hell bent on getting the information that we needed in order to help the mission. Right. So I called, um, I called some friends I knew that knew some people in Albany. They gave me some numbers. I called those numbers, you know, friendly on the phone. Hey, what's up? I know this is kind of a random cold call. My name's, you know, Jamie Thomas. We're looking for a pool in, you know, in Albany, it's the one in the woods at an old country club. Country club's gone. Pool's like really mellow with a big slant wall. He's like, yeah, I know the one. And he tells me it's like, oh, it's off of highway, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if, you know, you could possibly give us directions around King of the Road and we're trying to get there. And then you hear somebody in the background going like, who is that? And um, and he's like, he puts his hand on the phone. It's Jamie Thomas. He's calling, trying to go to the what's it called pool or whatever. And um, and the guy's like, goes back to the instructions and he's like, hey, hang on a second. He puts the phone down and he's like, kind of, you can kind of hear him like muffling, but arguing with his buddy. He gets back and he's like, actually, man, I'm sorry. I can't tell you. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? And he, he goes, I go, really? Like, I'm not going to, we're not going to blow out the spot or anything. You know, we're just going to film our tricks and leave. Anyway, um, he's like, no, sorry. I can't tell you. Like, you know, my, my friends are bombed. It's been our spot forever. And I was just like, it was, it hurt. <laughs> it hurt that I all of a sudden was like, you know, I always was a skate rat and I always felt like I was down for, 
helping people and doing what I could to help people out. And I just felt like I got, I, I took it personal anyway. I shouldn't have taken it personal. But anyway, I was like, man, for real? And then the other guy gets on the phone and he's like, I don't, what don't you get, man? What don't you get? We don't want you to go into our pool, whatever. And he was kind of, kind of hard, hard ass. And I was like, that's so lame, man. You know, I'm, we're just trying to skate. We're, we're on this thing. Explained it. And he's like, yeah, I know. I don't care. I don't care about any of that. I don't care what anybody you're saying. Anyway, we were like, I was like stewing on it. A guy gave me like the first two hints. And I was like, you know what? We're finding this pool. And, um, we were driving in the direction of Albany from Boston and I was just brainstorming. I was like, who else would know? And I was like, called the skate, it's called the skate shop. And I think the, the message has already been out. Don't tell those guys where the pool is. And I was like, you know what? There's gotta be a BMX or a rollerblade shop in town. And I was like, they'll know where it's at too. Everybody that plays on wheels is going to know where this thing's at. So I called them up and they're like, yeah, um, they gave us some directions and the, the first guy gave me the road or the exit or something. We had like pieces. I was like, I was like an investigative work. Anyway, we found the pool and when we wrote our, when we wrote our King of the Road article, we put directions to the pool in the article <laughs> and I'm not a pool skater, but apparently that's like big time, big time taboo. So Phelps pulls the directions out of the article, but he, Word gets around town that I put the directions to the pool in the article and that Phelps pulled them out. That shows up on the message boards. And the dudes that don't like Jamie Thomas to begin with, I don't know why I just said my name in the third person, <laughs> but it seemed appropriate. They all just start slaughtering me. And um, it starts off like normal. Like, you know, they're pissed that I, I tried to blow out their spot. Fair enough. You know, that's cool. I get it. Um, then it went all sorts of different ways. Went into every rumor has ever been said about me. Went into my wife. Went into my family. Went all over the place. I called Thrasher. I called Thrasher and some, you know, some of the guys that worked there. And I was like, hey, what do you guys do when, you know, there's a bunch of personal stuff or whatever um, on these threads? And he's like, oh, we'll take it down. It's not a big deal. I was like, all right. He takes it down. The next day it doubles in size. People are so burnt that I have the power to take down their thread. It comes back the next day and more people show up and it's like calling in the troops. Like the national guard has shown up on the slap message boards and it's going bananas and people are stacking on more stories and more, more assumptions and more just, it's just getting so big. Me not learning the first time call the guys at Thrasher back up and I'm like, Hey, this thing's gotten out of hand even to another level. And they're like, yeah, no worries. We'll take it down. They take it down again. The third time, it's a volcanic <laughs> eruption. I am now the, I don't know, Tom Cruise of skateboarding where I'm like trying to control freak it. I mean, it's funny. I just talked about re-editing the shorties video. And now I'm, now I'm, now I'm, now I'm taking threads down because I can't live with a million people talking crap on me. At any rate, it got taken down. And the, thir the second time it got taken down, the third one just went crazy and you know, I don't know if you've ever dealt with anything like this, but you ever hear where like people are like talking bad about you or there's, or, or reviews, like you said, you know, blow off some steam in the comments. You know, sometimes you could read a hundred comments and the two negative ones are the ones that really like pierce your heart. Try, try there being 10 pages of negative ones on the slap message boards and everybody, and some of them, they're telling stories that it was three people there. I'm like, you're one of two people. I know you're one of two people that know this story and you're, you know, and you're blowing it out like this or that. Anyway, long story short, I was like, you know what? I can't power play this. I'm, I'm signing up for a, a slap message board account and I named myself I Suck and I jumped in and I was like, all right, I'll meet you where you are. So I, got, I went in and I put in, this is obscene, I put in six to eight hours a day for over 30 days, clearing the air on every rumor, on every discussion, battling every comment head to head. And I was like, you know what? I've been here a long time. I can, I can endure this. And really what it was, it was like, it was a, the biggest lesson in humility that I'd ever had in my career, you know? And I was like, I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to think about this. I'm going to try and find the truth in what they're saying. And I'm going to talk through it 
and I learned a, um, I learned something very valuable, which was kind of like text warfare or like, or like anonymous warfare with people. And it was just pre social media. So it was great. It was such a good learning lesson, how to diffuse, disarm, embrace and show love and humility by just showing up and listening, taking it in, receiving it, telling my version of the story. And at first I was really defensive. Then I got called out for being defensive. And then I was, I was like, all right, that doesn't work. I got to massage this. And I, over a while, and I used to think the slap message board is, is a place where everybody just goes to talk shit. That's what you think, right? And most of the people that say that are people that are getting shit talked about them. But what I really discovered was it's, it's just like a skate shop. It's a a virtual skate shop where everyone's hanging and talking about what's going on, the news, what people feel about certain things. It's just, it's a really massive skate shop and there's lots of people there and everybody can chime in and you don't, no one knows what you look like or who you are. Um, Anyway, one guy was talking so much crap about us, so much crap, crap about me and we were on a tour and I was going through his town and I was like, you know what? You say all these things about me like you know me. And you don't, you don't know me, but you know what? I'm going to be in Atlanta this weekend. I'll come pick you up and I'll take you to the demo. And everybody, after I said that offer, everybody's like, you got to, you have to, you're so lame if you don't. And I was like, and if you want to fight or whatever, like, you know, I'll be there if, if that's, you know, what you're trying to do. I'm not trying to fight anybody, but you know, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm willing to like embrace this all in. And so Everyone calls him out. He's like, all right, pick me up. And then I, we had two vans and the whole van, the whole team went in the big van. I took the small van and the homie DM me his address. I went and picked him up and he barely talked the whole ride. It was really weird. Those internet muscles. But you got, but <laughs> it's easy to talk online, right? Yeah. I mean, we took photos together and like, and then he chimed on and was like, okay, okay. He's cool. <laughs> and that's some, for lack of a better term, legendary yeah, shit that's, to that's do that. And what amazing. do they say? Not to be all philosophical, but the best way to crush an enemy is to become their friend, right? And it's it's kind of true. And and another, I think it's a super common issue. You know, maybe it started slap message boards, but on the internet, you know, especially people with burner accounts where they can on Instagram, you see them saying really really mean stuff, but you don't know who it is. And it's like, I just think it's it's toxic. It's just toxic. It is toxic, it. but If you identify and understand that you can't control what they say, you can only control how you receive it. And, and you, you take the truth in it and you let that sit and you let that settle in. And, and you're like, you know, I I see there's like, there's 10% of truth in this and 90% of just mean spirited, you know, toxicity. But let me leave the 90% and let me take that 10% as, you know, receive it as input and be like, yeah, maybe you are an asshole. Maybe you are serious. Maybe you are a control freak, you know? And, but that's not, I mean, that's, that's whatever knowing those things, you know, and I don't need to go far to, to know that my wife's telling me, you know what I mean? (laughs) Um, but, but, um, you know, thinking about that, that's the way you come across, you know, and this, I, I was on the long game, you know, I was, well, I knew I was not going anywhere, you know, and I've been through a bunch of scenarios that I was like, man, sure would be nice to just leave skateboarding right now, you know, but you realize that you can endure anything, you know, and you just have to have the right attitude. And my attitude was some of the things these guys are saying about me is true, but a lot of it's not, most of it's not. And I'm going to be here to clear the air for my brand, for my fellow team writers, for my family for myself, for everybody. And maybe that's, you know, over the top to put in six to eight hours a day for, like I had to call in work and I I adjusted my work schedule around signing into the slap message boards and sifting through it. And it went to, it went to 120 pages or 108 pages. And then someone at Thrasher after three months shelved the, they shelved it, they archived it. And I don't know why, but for some reason it got archived and I got blamed again. And I was like, look, I didn't take that down. You know, by this time, they're valuing what I'm saying to be true because I've already faced all types of rumors. I mean, everything, man, everything possible. Like, there's a lot, you know, and I've been pretty outspoken my, throughout my career. So 
it, that kind of like multiplies the opportunities to talk crap, you know? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's incredible stuff and inspirational and in how to handle a task and also an ego deconstruction deal there. Yeah. Too, I mean, you get gassed up your whole life and then, you know, everybody's telling you this shit and then you get, it's hard to hear those things, right? Yeah, it didn't stick though. My ego got pumped up again. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how long it took, but I feel kind of now how I did, like in this phase of my life, I feel kind of how I did after the slap message boards, except now I feel like it's a part of my identity to be this way rather than like I'm forced to, to acknowledge these things, you know? Now it's a choice. I wake up every morning with... All right, this this fly is like I've yeah. We got Jeff Goldblum problem, <laughs> dude. I've never, we're, yeah, we're gonna have to install something to. Uh, there's these little zappers you plug into the yeah, wall, and the and them. the flies fly into them and just chill, and so they they just be gone. gone. Anyway, um, so I think that's it. Is it's a choice now rather than like you know that was like I don't know trial by fire or growth by fire or whatever, and it was a great experience. And also, I learned that. In any message board or any anonymous setting, if you throw out, just like a contest, if you throw out the extreme, the extreme, you know, what do you call them, ball swingers, and you throw out the complete, the extreme assholes, the medium is what matters. Copy, yeah. Yeah, and th and that's really what comments on message boards, comments on posts, that's really what it is. Well, uh, talking about, you know, we're, subject of ego, one thing that we like to talk about is Cheddar biscuits on this show. Now that is when we talk about increments of money, and a lot of the listeners they don't know what a snowboarder, what a skateboarder makes. And you know, I just got to ask because I know during circa days, uh, you know, maybe not America, but probably circa audio days, those royalty checks had to be like stupid. Can we just get a little? Can you just throw us a little bisque number here? What are we talking? Um, yeah, we made. We made it circa. We made over a few hundred grand a year, and our royalties broke it. So it, it were good times. Your royalties broke over a few hundred grand a year yeah. on top of making that. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. And then the Tony Hawk money was good. I mean, people have talked about it. Yeah, I was but, wondering that. I used to. Yeah, play I that think game. that <laughs> I think that for a couple years in a row, everybody in the game got a hundred, like a hundred k in royalty checks a year. You know, that's that's a lot for something that. You know, it's just dividends, really. It's like, you know, you already put in the work elsewhere. And it's cool because they made millions and millions, you know. I can only imagine what Tony's checks were like. Um, I remember you had the 540 kickflip as your special. Yeah. I, I want to say, like, upright, left. Uh, <laughs> I, it's probably still in <laughs> there if I real? started playing. <laughs> I, I could probably pull it up if we started going. Yeah, I mean, it. they, they were good times. I had no idea. You know, that's like. 99 to 2001 around there, you know? Um, but I, I, I started a business and I was taking that money and investing in the business. You know, I bought a, you know, a pretty normal house for the time I had a land cruiser and it like had TVs in it. I tried that out, but I never really floated away too much around that time. But when the business started really going good and the like, you know, before the bubble burst in the like 2008 zone, I bought a really big house and started remodeling it. Dude. Sorry about that, man. <laughs> Should we just feeling like I'm smelling like crap yeah, over we, here? We could take a break and just murk these flies. Real I think quick. it's one Let's, one badass fly that just is relentless. That's Jeff fly. Goldblum. That is yeah. Jeff for yeah. sure. Well, there's one that's lapping around. Yeah, that's here. not a fly though. That's like some kind of oh. that's some kind of like low level gnat sh yeah. situation. And then there's one that just yeah, it's killing me watching it mess with you. Yeah, he's messing with me. He's messing it's all right. I'm good. He used to mess with I can't. Con I can't control what he does. All I can control is how I react to it. That's what's the test of the Zen over here. <laughs> it's a test. Um. Yeah. Anyway, what I was saying was, is that, yeah, I, I floated away and bought a big house, and ooh, I got spanked on that one. I put a lot of money into a remodel and had to sell it in the down. It was rough. Bought it in the high, remodeled it, and sold it in the low. Exactly what they advise you not to do. Yeah, I did. I did all the stereotypical worst, you know, investment stuff, and I was pretty grounded for a while. But I floated away too, like the best of them. Well, that kind of brings me back to what you learn along the way, because you know you've you had those huge royalty checks, you know, America to fall into audio, which I found out you came did the logo for. You made the little audio. Yeah. No. Did I, is that false information? Yeah. 
false information. Okay. All right. Jose Gomez did the audio logo. I was there and I helped name the brand and I okay. helped, I helped with the logo, but I didn't make that cursive a thing. I okay. Would, I wouldn't okay. have done that. And then, um, but then following fast forward to fallen and it seems like you put all your, all your ducats into fallen and then like it had an awesome run, but what did you learn from that whole experience with fallen and everything? I'm going to pause you. We're going to go fly yeah. attack. Yeah, let's, let's get kill him. these flies. Look, at, he's on my nose. Yeah, dude, he's, <laughs> he's upsetting me. Okay, so we had to take a quick break due to a technical difficulty. We had a fly debacle. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum was hassling me. Yeah, hopefully he's transferred into a human and he is gone now. But geez. He was kind of bullying the yeah. chief, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> he was <laughs> him, and the, him, him and the slap message the board slap kids. Message board. Uh, but, yeah, I wanted to talk about, like, first of all, um, we're kind of sappy about our re- relationship with snowboarding or skating, and and um, I'm I. It seems like you are from the things I've listened to and read, and um, sometimes I like to know the lessons that you learn from snowboarding and skating. And you know, you've obviously made truckloads of money, and then you've had ups and downs. But I feel like sometimes you learn more from those downs. And then with Fallen, you know, it had an incredible run, and eventually went out of business what did you what did you learn from that whole experience with fallen what goes up must come down hmm. that's it that's it that's it that's what i learned recognize and, it yeah and um and diversify i think that i never expected to be as successful as i was so therefore when i'd reached these levels of either financial success or success with the companies um I didn't really have a plan, an exit plan. I was all in, all in all the time. And that's cool in theory, but like, I wasn't like, I mean, I had a 401k and then I'd put some money into a house and stuff. But when things went south in the business, I didn't really have this like, like massive parachute, you know? And, um, I was okay with it. But I had a family, I mean, we have a family of five. My wife had a family of five. And my irresponsibility of not diversifying and putting away a certain amount of money every single month into an untouchable account, like, became a real thing. You know, we had to sell. I sold pretty much all my stuff, sold my house, sold, you know, whatever, sold my stuff, my, my, my high worth stuff in order to take the equity and put it away as our nest egg. And then we were going to rent for a while and I was going to navigate a new direction in business and figure out, like, pick myself up again. Um, Because Fallen was, Fallen became the, you know, like the breadwinner of our distribution. And, you know, as fast as it went up, it went down at the same rate. And it wasn't because the brand sucked or we sucked. The the landscape of the industry just changed radically. And we were on a, you know, we were on the 10 year cycle. And then you had the economic crisis. So all those things were working against us. And even though it was still a cool brand and, it, you know, had a good team and we were making good shoes and making good product. And then we also had other outside factors. Our factory burnt down and we lost a whole season one time. And I'm sure you've heard of snowboard brands losing a whole season. It is gnarly. It is really gnarly it, to lose all of that money and to try and survive off of the income um, yeah, from the previous season. No, yeah. Most don't come back. And the only way we came back is we borrowed some money. I borrowed some money from the factory. Ironically, the factory, the owner of the factory, the one that burnt down, I borrowed some money. He infused some, some capital into the company. And um, it helped us, you know, make it through. Um, but ultimately, I wasn't as adamant about making sure that if everything went south, I had a backup plan. I see Jeff's back. Hmm. Anyway, hopefully the fan blows him away. Um, I didn't have that backup plan, you know, and I never was a backup. I never was a backup plan guy, you know, like when I was skating, I didn't have a backup plan. I was making video parts or weird. I was just, I wasn't taught to have a backup plan. My father was a backup plan guy, but we didn't really relate too well. So I never really got those lessons. I never really were like, I never was like sitting on the log, like at sunset and him telling me some cool stuff, you know, like that would be cool, but it just never happened, you know? And my mom I got more lessons from her and her, her lessons were you work hard and you keep working hard, you know, and she wasn't a saver. She was, she ran it hot. She had a messy car. She was very creative, very amazing, very always there for people. 
And I took those lessons and that's what I did. I ran it hot. I tried to be there for people and I was all in, you know, and, and um, it became really obvious and that became a big wedge in my wife and I's relationship. And so dealing with the failure of a company collapsing is a lot. You know, you invest a lot in these brands, a lot of emotion, a lot of, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, as they say. Um, but also money, you invest money and you invest capital into seeing this thing work. And usually when it doesn't work, you don't really get anything out of it. You know, you don't get something back. You try everything until there's nothing left. And in this situation, since we, since I took in some capital into the company, I owed this, I owed our factory a million bucks. And it was like a million dollar note that I owed. And you know, in theory, we were going to turn the company around and pay them a hundred dollars or hundred, hundred, hundred dollars a year for the next hundred thousand years. Um, anyway, I um, I um, I was, you know, the plan was to pay them like a hundred, hundred and fifty k a year as we turn the company around, you know, and pay this thing down. And the company just got smaller and smaller and smaller, and it got to a point where a million bucks wasn't a lot of money in the beginning, but now the company's so small. And it's not really working. We're not really meet, meeting our pre-book numbers even, you know. And I'm, like, calling my friends that own shops, like, you know, talking them to them about making a pre-book. And I'm basically asking them to support our brand. And they're like, I'd love to, but it just doesn't sell. We can't invest money into things that aren't working, you know. Like, Nike, Adidas, Vans, Converse are it. And I was like, I know, I know, you know, whatever. Anyway, so it just wasn't working. The company wasn't working. And... I was just like, you know what? I got to just deal with settling up with, you know, the factory that loaned us some money. And um, I had all the, I had zero, all of those companies were collateral. So I had to negotiate and I had to pay them a little bit of money. And then I gave them the trade, fallen the trademarks and just kind of had to walk away. And that's how, that's how and why we closed shop. It wasn't working and I owed somebody a million bucks. And so my goal was to keep zero free and clear. So I basically carved zero out of the deal and then gave them a little bit of cash from savings that I paid them in payments. And then I, and then I um, gave them the trademarks. Eventually, two years later, they sold the trademarks to one of the distributors in Argentina. That distributor relaunched the brand in South America because they had a footwear factory down there. It went really well, continued to go well. They brought it to Europe. Splash in Europe, it went well. They brought it to the States and hired you know, one of my old business partners as a consultant you know, to, to manage the marketing and direction of the brand. He went and, you know, approached me and approached everybody that used to be on the team, got the band back together, and they're off and running in a, in a you know, their second life. That's why it exists today. I don't have anything to do with it, and I have, you know, no equity, no involvement whatsoever. It just, I put a lot of time into it, and I walked away from it. And, um, you know, and for me, it was like, I'm not going to cash in all my chips just to keep this brand alive, you know. Yeah. So, that was it. And I, what I learned was is that what goes up must come down. And an exit plan does not mean you don't believe in the current plan that you're, that you're on. It just means that you're preparing for the worst. Mm -hmm. And I never prepared for the worst. I was yeah. just, this That's is it. This is all. I, and a lot of it's ego. A lot of it's pride. A lot of it's just lack of listening. You know, people told me that. Like, I, I went and had a meeting with Fausto at Thrasher one time. And he goes, sit down. He shuts the door. He's like, I, he's like, I know you're killing it right now. We were. Business was good. He's like, you know, I know you're here working on an interview. It's going to be cool. Super excited. Let me tell you some advice. You make yourself rich. You take care of your family. F the company. The company doesn't care about you. And those employees, they care about you until you can't care for them. He's like, so what you do is you take money out of that company as much as you can, as often as you can, and you set yourself up for life and you set your family up for life. And I was like, this guy's crazy. What is he even talking about? Like, this is, I was like, that, well, that's not the way I run my company. And he's like, I know. You're young. Everything's working. I get it. I'm giving you this advice. Please take it. It was great advice. I didn't take yeah. it. I, that is great. That really is great advice. great advice. I mean, it was just how brash he told it. <laughs> yeah. Make he he said straight up, f the company, make yourself rich. And I just was like, ah, I don't want to be rich, you know. But what's what's wrong with having money and taking care of your family? But at that time, my identity wasn't that. My identity was I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna try and stay down with the people. I want to like be about the people, 
you know, this is 2003 or 2004. So 2008, I, you know, I started taking his advice, but didn't even do it right. <laughs> Bought a big house. That's not, that's not, that's not taking, you know, True. taking care of your family. So anyway, I, you know, you learn the most from your biggest failures mm -hmm. wow. and, and those lessons were so invaluable and no one could ever tell me that stuff. Like, like the feeling of failing, mm -hmm. you know? Well, that's the thing is like, People can tell you to do something a million times, but until you fall on your face, yeah. that's the only way to learn. And that's the only way I learn. And then also going back to that being all in. The being all in works great for the barefoot back 50. You know what I mean? The being all, the being all in works great for the grind down the big rail for all those. But then, you know, it doesn't always, always work for, biz, for business. And I kind of want to pivot into zero talk. Uh, your brand zero if you were to rewind back to myself over 20 years ago, my first skateboard was a zero. And if you were to tell me, I'd be sitting next to Jamie Thomas in my garage <laughs> filled with shit talking about zero, I would be shitting my little bloomers. So um, I don't really know where I'm going with this, but where is it? Where, <laughs> I just wanted to tell that story. And, uh, yeah, what's going on with zero these days? Because it's, it's, it's had a hell of a ride, and it's still going strong. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it um it'll be 25 years next year so that's cool and to know that i've been doing something consistently for 25 years cool um you know i i detached a little bit from zero or skateboarding being like my whole identity which we kind of talked about early on but i did that really purposely some of my relationships my interpersonal relationships were were struggling and i feel like that was because i was living in that extended adolescent zone and um 2019 i didn't skate very much at all. And um, I got out of the van. The van go, the guys link up every weekend and go skate. They go film, they go skate curbs, they go do something every weekend. It's pretty like consistent because their lives, you know, like they, they range from 20 or, you know, whatever, 16 to 30, you know, and 32. And their lives are skateboarding, you know, and it's just like filming and playing, you know, and, um, obviously being productive and working on projects and stuff, but it's also just goofing off and having fun with each other. You know, that's just what they do. So I, I didn't get in the van for the year of 2019. I, I don't think at all, not one time. That was a big departure for me. They stopped kind of calling me on the weekends and I just stopped going and I just spent time with the family and spent time learning how to integrate myself into my family the way they needed me. Um, and then also practicing living an identity grounded in humility and connection with people rather than like keep doing what I'm doing because it's not working. So I say that to preface it, that, that time period of me disconnecting from my identity helped me implement some healthy practices and boundaries in my life that helped me be a better leader at zero and also be able to plan better and see the big picture of where Zero's going and what we should be doing as a brand and to identify the priorities of the brand because I got my own priorities figured out. I didn't have my own priorities figured out, so how could I navigate what the priorities of the brand are? Sometimes people can do one or the other, but I couldn't. I was just running both very haphazardly. And um, so Zero is on a good run. I mean, skateboarding's on a good run right now. We're on a cycle, we're on a cycle upswing. We're on a cycle upswing, you know, of, you know, the cycles of skateboarding. It's, you know, things sucked for about 10 years or so, plus or minus a few. And 2019 was the best year in 10 years for most people. And 2020 was staged to be even better. So then COVID hits and everyone is really nervous. Like skateboarding's going to, you know, suffer. Economy's going to suffer. And skateboarding just goes to a whole nother like stratosphere for multiple reasons. You got a lot of support. You know, you had the Olympics everyone was excited about. I don't know if anybody's excited about it. Pros aren't. Some people hate it, whatever. Everybody's indifferent about that. People are different about it. But um, you also had video games coming out. You got Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 that's come out. You got EA announcing they're making a new game. You got um, those other video games that are more like phone-based games or like gradual updates every couple of weeks. Lots of enthusiasm and excitement around skateboarding. It's like, you know, 
there's the Louis Vuitton Pro Shoe with Lucian Clark. There's just skateboarding's getting a lot of attention. So many female skateboarders, different ethnicities, different, you know, uh, like sexuality, like so much, so many barriers have been broken down. It's like radical. It's a radical time in skateboarding. It's really cool. But when organized sports are canceled, all individual sports are through the roof. And it's not snowboard season, but it's definitely skateboard season. Skateboarding, biking, camping, surfing, bodyboarding, sites sold out everywhere. Because everyone's like, all right, I'm not, I'm not playing basketball. I'm not playing baseball. I'm not doing all these other sports. What am I going to do? And so people that had skated in the past or might have been into it, might not have been into it, they got into it, and sales went crazy. And, and then on top of that, you had breaking the supply chain, and almost everywhere, COVID was hitting factories at different times. And then the demand's way up, and everybody's coming out of the woodworks to double and triple and quadruple their orders. And then the factory's not running at full capacity. And then after that, you have a log shortage. And so the demand for skateboards is so high. So to say that things at zero are going well is like, yeah, they're going well. Like You'd have to really suck right now for them not to be going well. But they're going even better because there's harmony in the brand. You know, Chris Cole just came back. Um, you know, Dane Berman is firing, and he's, he's a great leader. He's like helping pave the way for our younger pros and other guys, showing them what it is to do. Um, Chris Weimer, you know, one of our, like, you know, talented, like, rookies, and he's in his second or third year. He's, like, moved from Virginia to California, and he's, like, in the mix every day, and he's working on a video part, and there's lots of stuff happening. Um, New Thrasher, we had multiple interviews. Before that, we had one of our AMs had a major interview. Like, there's just a lot happening, and those guys are all really stoked. And the coolest part is, is that I always thought I had to be a part of everything in order for things to work. I had that feeling of like, if I'm not in control, then I don't know what's going to happen, you know? But the best thing I could have done was surrender and let those guys figure it out on their own for the year and, and just be like, okay, I need to go figure my stuff out. I'm sure you guys got it. Let me know if you need gas or you need me to fix the van or buy tapes or whatever, you know? I'm here, but I'm just not going to be here like navigating. And those guys, Dane picked up Dane picked up the pace. Our team manager picked up the pace. All the other guys on the team picked it up. And, they're, you know, they all just made it happen. And they filmed a new AM video that they've been working on for a year. And the filmer, you know, everyone just made it happen. So it's so great that those guys are all doing it. And it's probably more empowering for them because they're doing it themselves and they're making it happen on their own. And our team manager turned into a full-time photographer now. And he's shooting all their interviews and all their ads. And it's you know, his name's Kurt, and it's amazing watching these guys progress and do their thing, and I'm just happy to be able to be in a position to support them in some way, shape, or form, you know, and trying to navigate what that looks like in the future, but yeah, Zero's firing on all cylinders, and we've had a few drops and product releases sell out like we never have seen before, and it's been radical, you know, and we've all been in back there packing boxes together, and it's small. It's not like big days like it was, but it's grounded. We know what we're about. We know what we are. And it's good, man. It feels good. Yeah, that's that's Dude, really rad. Congrats on 25 years. That's amazing. Thanks. That's really cool. I have a couple Patreon questions kind of around what we're talking about. All right. Um, the first one, you just mentioned Chris Cole. Sean Fitzpatrick wants to know what it's like to work with Chris Cole again now that he's back on zero. I know that you all worked together a lot back before he left. So I guess he's just interested how that is, how it, how it is working with him again. Yeah. So I talked about this Really randomly, I did like a nine club spot. They do like this Zoom call thing. Um, I did one of those, and we talked about it for a bit. Um, but that's kind of a disclaimer. If you watch both of these, you're going to hear it twice. Um, Cole and I had like such good chemistry in the beginning of his kind of pro career and when he first got on Zero. Um, you know, and we, we were talking through everything together and talking about ideas and either whether we're coming up with lines or ideas at spots or video part ideas or song ideas, whatever. We worked really well together. And then Cole transitioned as Cole career, as Cole's career started to blow up. It had surpassed anything that I'd ever experienced. And also he was such an amazing contest skater that that became his bread and butter, you know, and the contest scene probably like in snowboarding and like in surfing is a whole nother world. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not even 
like what we were doing. They're staying in super nice hotels. They're traveling all the time. There's a group of guys and they, they're always together because they're the contest dudes. So he was contest became the focus. And it was like, you know, sometimes it felt like he would be slumming it, hanging out with us, you know? And I don't know that he ever intentionally made it feel that way. We just kind of felt like he didn't hang out as much anymore. And he was only on tour for a portion of each tour. And it just, it, you know, we'd kind of grown apart because he had, he'd taken a different path that I didn't even know anything about. I didn't know. I can't go and be on the sidelines coaching him at contests. You know, I don't know that world. You know, I can, I can, I'm not saying he even needed a coach, but what I'm getting at is, is that our chemistry worked is because I would be in the streets, either filming him or skating with him, helping him work through, like I, I talk about this. It's like a golf caddy, helping him work through whatever it is that he's battling whether it's the trick he's battling or the ideas for the trick, I was just always there trying to be of, of, of service and we worked really well together. And, um, you know, we are not hanging out as much anymore and it's, um, we're not hanging out as much anymore and he's kind of in the contest zone and he's hanging out with those guys. And that was when the social media separation kind of happened too. Like if you hang out around a bunch of other guys with a half a million or more followers, kind of like makes sense you guys like hang out together and you promote each other and you guys all float off into the superstardom you know and that kind of seemed like what was happening you know and it was not that I didn't want to be a superstar too but my my kind of time had passed you know I was still a pro and I'm still a pro but I wasn't like getting invited to all that stuff so the relationship naturally kind of like went it separate ways and, um, and then we would do a video and he would decide whether, what role he wanted to play and come back in and do the video. But it was kind of like he would fly in and just do whatever he needed to do and then be out. And it was kind of just like growing apart. And then eventually it just made sense for him to go navigate something else. And, you know, he called and quit. And um, he had some, some equity in the brand and he was in contract. So he sacrificed his equity in order to navigate his, you know, his opportunities. And um, he went his own way. And... You know, and it felt right. The timing for that felt right. You know, we don't talk and hang out anymore. And it was almost like to a disservice. Like, I wasn't always calling him like, hey, this is what's going on at the company. You know, I was like trying to figure out how to keep the train on the tracks. You know, like calling Cole, even though it should be a priority, it wasn't my first priority, you know. And so I think that hurt too, you know. I'm not calling him anymore to tell him like, hey, this news is breaking tomorrow. I just want to give you a heads up. He'd find out things like, anyone else would, you know, and that's just another definitive example of that the relationship isn't close, you know. So anyway, he went his, his, his separate ways and it made sense. The timing was right and we paid him a lot. That And the company was much smaller now, so it definitely helped the company. Um, so it was it was good, you know, it was, timing was right. We didn't have much of a relationship for those five years that he was away, yeah, four or five years um, while he rode for Plan B. First, he was kind of navigating, maybe doing his own thing, and then checking stuff out, rode for Plan B for a while. And then when Plan B had run its course and he was kind of leaving that situation, it had nothing to do with us, um, you know, and then the opportunity for him to come back arose, and I felt like we're in no rush, like zero – we're surviving fine. Things are good. We're not, we're not looking for a savior. We're not looking for somebody to like blow, blow us up, you know, like I want to find a good sustainable like existence for this brand without a superstar. You know, I'm no longer a superstar, you know, and I don't know that I ever was like he is, but you know, I was a big name for a long time and, and you know, maybe it's arguably I still am, but it's in a different way. You know, it's not in like a performance way. It's in like a, old dog way. At any rate, we started having the conversation and, um, I just wanted to take it really slow. And I wanted to talk about the past, talk about the present or where we were at and what we were doing and how we were doing things and talk about the future. And we took it really slow. And we, we basically formed a relationship over about a year and then slowly started putting the pieces together and outlining what it would look like if he came back. And it was, um, it was perfect, you know? And, and, I quickly realized, and he, I think he talks about this in an interview recently, but I quickly realized that when we were on the same page, we have really great chemistry, you know, and we, we, um, we complement each other very well, 
you know, I'm thinking about his graphics. I'm thinking about how it's all going to fit together. I give him pitches and I get his feedback. I make adjustments, you know, and I'm a lot more easygoing than I ever was in the past. And I'm not so rigid. And it's been, um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with him and just like, it's been cool. And it's been so cool watching all the fans celebrate, you know, like people tell me congrats and I'm like, should I be the one congratulated? Like, I'm not sure. You know, I guess the brand, it's like exciting for the brand. But more importantly, I'm, I'm happy for Chris. Like, he's found a home again. He can wear those shirts and ride those boards and feel, like, good about it. Not just can, that he had a history there, that he and I have, like, a real relationship. And that he has a real relationship with everybody on the team. And that he took a year kind of to be on flow almost. You know, to, like, yeah. navigate that and make sure that everything felt good by everybody. I'll tell you, uh, as a fan of skateboarding, Chris Cole just looks right with a zero under. Like, he should be skating on a zero, but in my IMO, in my opinion. And um, on the subject of zero, to kind of pivot quickly, uh, Scott Stevens is a legendary snowboarder. He's uh, a lot of people's favorite. And I, I called him today. I said, hey, we're sitting down with the chief. He's wearing a zero hoodie. He was so hyped. He's like, you got to be shitting me. Okay. And uh, he was saying that I think he ordered his wife the cross sweatpants. Anyway, he was all excited. But I have a guest question for you. You have to put the headphones on. Okay. From Scotty Stevens. And the guest question is presented by Solomon Snowboards. If you're thinking about getting yourself a snowboard this winter, make sure it's a damn Solomon. They're the best ones out. All right. Let's get into this guest question from Scotty Stevens. Hey, Bombhole, this uh, question's for Jamie Thomas. And uh, the question is, what is um, your favorite video part you've ever filmed? Um, I love them all, so I'm excited to hear the answer. Thanks. That's it? Do I keep the headphones on? Uh, I have another one. You have one more later. Okay. You can keep it on. We'll, go, we'll get into the okay. next one after this. Okay. I think dying to live is my best video part. And when I say my best, I think it has the most comprehensive... It's the, it's the most comprehensive uh, display of what I have to offer. It has some switch tricks. It has big stuff. It has lines. Some of the gear gets a little wacky. And it's like a little bit of like boot cut rock and roll 70s looking thing. But I think that that's the, I think, <laughs> I think that's the best uh, like trick for trick, pound for pound. I think that's my best performance. My, and then I, I kind of lean more towards a little more of my favorite is more of the earlier ones because Welcome to Hell, I've talked about this several times, but Welcome to Hell, I was navigating so much newness in my life and I was discovering my method and my process. And there's something really special about that when you're like putting those pieces together and things are starting to work and not just work, they're working for the first time. And you realize like, I have something to offer. I have something to offer the skateboard world. And that was like a crazy feeling to know that, okay, this is going to be something. This is going to be something special for me and uh, maybe for other people. But I know I'm, I'm on to something here. And I think that probably holds the most dear uh, place in my heart just because of that feeling. You know, that, that feeling of, yeah, this is, this is new and I got something to offer. I'll tell you what I was hoping you would say. And that's my personal favorite, chomp on this. <laughs> that's the one, dude. Like, it's like, I know that's your answer, but I just don't think it's the right answer. I think chomp on this is the right answer. <laughs> well, you just wanted it to be the answer. <laughs> chomp on this, to be fair, chomp on this was leftovers with about 10 to 15 fun tricks. So it was great. I had, you know, Master P, which was, you know, I, I didn't. Do. Great track. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I didn't veer from the course very much. So that was kind of like a shocker. And it made sense to veer from the course for that project just because the whole thing was so upside down. Um, but when I watch that part, I just think this is a bunch of leftovers and about 10 fun tricks. That's what it feels like, that's what it feels like to me because it's between, it's between Miss Light Youth and Dying to Live. And I remember going to the premiere and going, man, that footage is crap. But then everyone loved it. And I think it's more feeling. Everyone it's just the likes vibe. the feeling. Yeah, There's the vibe. There's feeling in video yeah. parts. Yeah, you know, but, you know, sometimes you're your worst critic and sometimes you're judging it from a jacked lens. You're just like, you know, what do my tricks look like? Ah, oh, my tricks suck. I don't know. But when I watch it back now, I'm pretty nostalgic about it. And Ty Evans' editing is so cool. Like me scratching and, you know, like 
I don't know, all of it. He basically enhanced me like he did in the Transro videos, you know, like Stevie Williams Love Park section. So good. And the reason, anyway, he enhanced me to make me look all fun and crazy. And really, I'm all serious and like, you know, <laughs> sour. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just kidding. I'm not sour. <laughs> That's No, I love hearing that. I lo- that one, I mean, I feel like that one just changed your whole personality because it, di- it was these serious, dramatic parts, mm-hmm. grinding big rails. And all of a sudden, you got Master P, Hootie Who. You're wearing a like a handkerchief and like yeah. all this it's incredible but um on that subject we're gonna do what we call pivot it's a word we like to abuse heavily yeah you said it quite a few times <laughs> yeah the listeners don't like it but we just keep hammering on it but um this is a topic out of boy this is a topic that is often avoided it's kind of like um i think it can be good and bad it's like you know you, you take somebody that's like a vegan or you take somebody that's a meat eater or you take somebody with politics and and when they they jam your opinion down their th- throat it's kind of like people get turned off by it and it freaks them out so no one, no one likes anything jammed down their throat by the way <laughs> <laughs> well th- th- that's debatable for some but yeah i agree personally i can agree with that but that kind of is a preface for a guest question presented by solomon from jeremy jones so here we go jamie I know the there's been a spiritual element in your life early in your career. I feel like it was something that you used. Um, I remember you spoke about it a few times as a tool to, um, you know, to support you. Uh, at some point, you started to pull away from that. And I think recently you've pulled it back and started to use that again. I'm curious what those pivot points were the the kind of pull back and then or the pull away rather and then now the pull back what are those things that 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 make that happen like how how do we get there um maybe a little too deep i love you guys enjoy the time in the booth um i'm out thank you we're getting deep yeah this is a that's a that's a big one to unpack that's a loaded question can i take the headphones off yeah you can take them off now all right um okay to start my mother was a christian growing up at 14 i told her i did not believe in god and it was crushing to her believing in god was not convenient and all the crazy stories in the bible i just couldn't make sense of i also wanted to live a rebellious i wanted to live in rebellion and debauchery just like that at in my 15, 16, my rebellious, at the peak of my defiance, I didn't want all those rules, and I, I didn't see how those rules could benefit me or make any sense. So I tried it my way, and, you know, I quit drinking and quit smoking weed and cigarettes right before I turned 16. August, August 91? Yeah. No, yeah. I think August 91... I was at a party, all my friends were hammered, and I like had this crazy epiphany, went into the garage, smoked a cigarette, I told this story before, smoked a cigarette, watched a cigarette burn, and imagined that was my life, and I was throwing it away, and then I was going to be in a garage like this for the next 20 years, pissing away my life in small town Alabama, no, no disrespect to anybody who lives in a small town, but I just knew that I wanted more, and so I put that cigarette out, and I was done, but I still was like, I was a heathen pretty much for the most part, minus the, minus the substance abuse for most of my teen years. And I married a really good woman, and she was a Christian, and she had expressed her views to me, you know, and I was like, ah, I don't know, you know, that I just can't make sense of it all. And I'd heard, you know, her tell me her version of what belief looked like. It was a lot different than what I grew up with. It wasn't so hellfire and brimstone. It was a lot more love and compassion and embrace. And I started to like, yeah, I could see that. I could see why that, how that could help people. You know, it's just like, and you know, and she always had this thing that if you don't believe in God, you're making yourself God. You are, you are entitling yourself as the, you're making your own rules and you're living by your own rules and it puts a lot of pressure on you. And if you didn't have good modeling growing up, that's a lot of pressure. So I always had that kind of dinging around in the back of my head. I went to Tim Brosh's funeral, heard everybody talking about Tim Brosh, and 
you know, they were talking about him being in a better place or a different place or that he was in heaven. And I was just like, man, if I died right now, I'm not going, I'm not going to heaven. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not a bad, I'm not the worst guy out, but I definitely didn't feel like I had it together. And I'd never really, I'd never really owned up to all the rotten things I'd done in my life. Anyway, I had a real gnarly time. I had a real, I mean, a meeting with Jesus right then. And I had heard enough about the gospel to know the steps of how it worked. And so in this funeral home, I fell to my knees and just started crying. And I didn't even know what I was doing. But every rotten thing that I'd ever done that I had stuffed way down into my shoes all started coming to the surface. And I couldn't bear it. I couldn't understand how I could remember all these things. We're talking like a hundred things. Like, you know, shot the girl in the leg with the BB gun across the canal when you're in fifth grade. Like, you know, stole the skateboard from your, like, friend down the, sh- or from some kid down the street and got a spanking and, like, whatever. Like, <laughs> all the rotten stuff. The most rotten stuff that I'd done. All the lies I'd told. Anyway, man, it's all sort of rushing to the surface. And I fell to my knees and asked the Lord f- for forgiveness and to help me. And I started, I embarked on a journey of faith. I went to church um, with my wife the following Sunday. And they did a you know, an altar call where they asked people to accept the Lord. And I did it, but I didn't felt nothing. And the reality was, is that I had done it the week before in the funeral home. And I had this crazy, like heightened sense of understanding and emotion. I'd never felt my emotions be that heightened. At any rate, I, um, I was very impressionable. I'm like 22, 22, 23, right after, well, right after misled youth. Anyway, I was in a really crazy place and you know, people found out that I became a Christian because I put a board out with a cross on it because I'm outspoken about the things I'm into. I put a board out with a cross on it and everybody told me that board's not going to sell. It's going to kill your career. You know, like you're like this like heavy metal guy. Everyone's going to think you're like soft and lame. And I was like, you know what? I don't care. I don't care what they think. I'm going to put it out. And um, it sold really well. And then everyone said I put it out to make money. So it's ironic. But at any rate, it sold well. And then, because there was lots of people that felt oppressed and they didn't have anyone to look to and they bought the board, I guess. So then churches started finding out that I was a Christian and I started getting recruited for all this ministry work. I didn't have any prep in this. I just, just like, I felt like it's my responsibility. Like you're the, like, you're the biggest name in skateboarding that believes at the moment or that is professing their faith. So this is your responsibility to go speak at these skate events and at these churches and anyway I did that for a year or two and each one felt painful in a different for a different reason and a lot of times I'd either overshare or not really have a plan and I'd feel just raw and exposed and then other times I would just give my story and be like you know what I I lived with this fleeting feeling for so long and now I'm I'm learning to have a belief in something greater than myself then I would get off the stage and they would come on with a hellfire and brimstone that you're going to hell if you don't surrender right now. And all these skate kids impressionable by me telling them my story would like raise their hand and come to know the Lord or come to accept the Lord. And then I was like the conduit and the like catalyst to make that happen. And I felt like I was just being used up. And then I would feel empty for a couple of days and sometimes weeks. And then I got kind of burned out on that. And then I started resenting it. And then I didn't stop believing but I stopped practicing as much. And this is like over a couple of years. I had a couple of cross boards and still, and then after a while, I kind of felt like I wasn't really practicing my faith in a way that the boards made sense. So I stopped like representing that. And then I slowly kind of fell into back into, you know, just not, not a healthy morality. Um, you know, I mean, I wasn't doing that rotten of stuff maybe, but I just wasn't living honestly. I wasn't living authentically. And it took the companies falling apart and relationships falling apart. And in the end, it took my my relationship with my wife being at the edge of a cliff in order for me to realize that I had no governor and I had no modeling growing up that really implemented a foundation for how to live. And I needed help. Well, one thing, yeah, that's awesome that you shared all that stuff. Really love that. And I think be it 
spirituality, be it, be it Buddhism, Judaism, therapy, any type of step in betterment of yourself. You know, you look at somebody like uh, and- Andrew Reynolds is sober, you know, and you tell him telling that story inspires other people to be sober. And I think it's cool for you to talk about that stuff. And what I was wondering is like, and fo- I watch like, I watch conventional sports, right? And they're like, after somebody gets a touchdown or whatever, they're always like, I'd like to thank God or Jesus, or I'd like to thank this person or that person. Like they're always, there's no problem with religion in these conventional sports, but you know, does it feel like there's also, it's like really rare and unex- like a little bit more unaccepted in action sports when people, you know, bring up their faith? I think so, because I think that skateboarding is more rebellious than all those organized sports. And you're, you're speaking, you know, like you're a DJ speaking to your audience and your audi- audience is a bunch of rebels, mm-hmm. you know, and, and he, and similar to snowboarding, hedonism and debauchery, I mean, is... It goes hand in hand with that rebellious adolescent nature, you know, your perpetual teenager. And I think that's why, and people, people also feel a little bit like called out or threatened a little bit. I think if you're saying something like that, cause you're striking a nerve of discomfort, like, you know, and there's a lot of contrarianism in skateboarding. That's like, you know, I don't know about snowboarding, but in skateboarding there is where it's like, you're a purist and, If Goldblum's on the scene again, dude, if you killed him like that, I'd be you'd be so Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> Chopsticks. Yeah, um, I, I'm okay to talk about it, man. I got nothing to prove to anybody anymore. You know, I've been doing I've been doing this a long time, and you like me, cool. You don't, cool. Like you think I'm lame for liking Jesus, and that's whack, cool. You think it's cool, cool. That's even cooler. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. I'm fine, man. And that's why, you know, you asked me, do you want to rehearse? I was like, no, I, I, I feel good. I feel good. I'm thankful to be here. Mm-hmm. Thankful to be at Jeremy's. I'm thankful to, that you guys even want me on this show. Thankful anybody wants to hear what I got to say. That's cool. Grateful. That's amazing that all these, uh, when it first came to you, that all your negative things you had done came back to you at once. I mean, that's... That sounds Abby, that sounds like a I've weird. I've heard the story before, you know, and I've read about it, and that's what happens, right? It's. I don't know if that's what happens. Yeah, I've definitely. Heard I think it that, happening to people. Yeah, I think that my situation is dramatic, like everything in my life has been. Yeah, like Jeff, like Jeff Goldblum, like the Jeff fly that won't, that's bullying the chief repeatedly. Yeah, he used to bully me actually, so it's kind of nice. I could see stuff getting really caught in your beard, yeah. and that being a that yeah. being a that's safe haven. Probably what gets a, them over a, here. A safe, a safe haven snack, for flies. Snack out of my beard. Um, Gold Bloom's got a little nest in the beard. But yeah, I don't. I don't know that that. I no. I never heard that's how it happens. I just know that I had done some rotten things that I'd never talked to anybody about, and never told anybody about. And you know, you're only as sick as your secrets. Yeah, I've heard that in uh, some near death experiences. That's how it's happened. And I don't know if you've ever read on that, but well, I, I haven't. But I've I, I try and I try and ask for forgiveness regularly now, yeah. so that way I'm not I don't have that pile up. Yeah, I don't want that pile up again. Oh yeah, because it's a scary thing. Yeah, it's a volcanic. Come at you all at once. Well, and there's so much shame that kind of can come with it, you know. And it's like if you're not, and that and that's also like when you're wrong, admit it. You know, and we're talking step work here. You yeah. know, but mm-hmm. when you're wrong, you admit it, and you you when you're not doing what you said you were going to do, you acknowledge it. You know, and all your relationships can go a lot better. You know, if everybody in high school had to go through the 12 steps, you know what I mean? You'd have a, you'd have a lot more functional human beings that were caring for each other. Yeah. Almost. They should teach that before some of the other things they teach. Yeah. A lot of, a <laughs> lot of great lessons in there. And I've been through one myself for drinking and whatever. And it's an interesting thing. Talk, like it, talking about inclusivity, right? It's like it, you talk about an action sport. It's like, it's, you know, we're very inclusive. It's getting so much better being gay or lesbian, or racial, all these things are, are becoming, but it's some of the few things, like, when it comes to belief systems, if somebody has a different belief, like, that one's maybe not as widely accepted in some ways, and it's an interesting... Yeah, I don't, I don't think it is, and I think that it's just culture, you know, but yeah. uh, somebody has to come and break those barriers down, mm-hmm. you know, and somebody has to not lose the plot and break the barriers down. You know, when I say that, meaning, like, if anyone goes head over heels, they're no longer heard. You know, because they're just, they're just going off about it, you yeah. know, and then everybody's like, ah, yeah, leave, me much, yeah. leave me alone, leave me alone. And 
you know, I think that the way that, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, keep on this, but the way that Jesus, like, modeled how to live was, like, loving and showing up for people and serving others. Like, that's how you say you're a Christian. You don't tell everybody, like, yo, you got to be a Christian like me. Like, I'm, I'm sick. You want to be cool, too? You be a Christian, and this works for me, and it's going to work for you, and that's what you need. Like, it's not people for anyone. Like, they don't like those people. No, yeah. <laughs> it's not, those aren't well liked. No, it's not for anyone to tell anyone what anyone else needs. You can tell, you can share, and, that, you know, program work helps with that, too. Yeah. You, you know, it's an I. It's an I statement. You can share what's worked for you, mm-hmm. and, and if they can take something from it, great. And if they can't, they can't. But you showing up for them every day and being there and always being available to talk and listen and hug them or whatever, man, serve them, you know, bring them, bring them a donut. You know, it, 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 but it, but it also it goes so it goes so much further to anything you believe in. It doesn't have to be religion. Even let's just talk, take diet for example. Like in the same way, some people with their religion are like they get on their soapbox. They say you need to believe this because this is what I believe. A lot of times, you take somebody like I have a friend, uh, Sage. He's vegan, right? And I'm I eat meat, and I've not and I'm not. And you know, there's some people that are like you need to eat like this. This is the way to eat. This is the only dietary way. And you're like, dude, get up, get the fuck away from me, okay? I don't want to, I don't want to hear the shit. But then I see him; he's like working out with us. He's running marathons, and I'm like, he's not preaching anything on me. But I'm like, oh, okay. He yeah. is preaching with his actions. He's preaching with his actions, but that yeah. l- that's the attraction rather than promotion, yeah. you know? Right? That's that works so much better than saying, hey guys, you need to do this. You're just, but like, just you're leading through your actions is way stronger in whatever the fuck you're doing. I think I agree with you. It's yeah. leading by example. It's modeling. It's, yeah. it's, it's being authentic and doing what your thing is. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times when people preach about whatever it is they're going on about every single time they preach, they're convincing themselves that what they, what they're doing is the right thing to do. And it's like, it's more for them than it is for you. Yeah. And then if you were to do it, that would affirm them and give them acknowledgement that what they're doing makes sense and the way they're delivering, it makes sense. And that the way that they're living makes sense. So I, you know, and you realize that, you know, we got to work our own stuff out. You know I mean? You can't be working it out on other people, you know, and so many people do that. And I did it forever and ever. I was, you know, you heard that phrase, you meet three assholes in a day, chances are you're the asshole. You know, I'm, I met a lot of assholes in my life. One, I met a lot of assholes in my life. <laughs> this is a, you know what? That's your words to live by right there. Yeah. Might be. I've never heard that. That's great. I feel like, uh, what do you think? I, one she, more topic I just wanted to talk about was the leap of faith, man. That's uh, looking at that photo again, revisiting it last night. That's nuts, dude. Are you sick of talking about it? Yeah. All right. That's just me on a personal, personal level. No, it's fair. I, I mean, it's it's the elephant in the room. We got to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, we don't yeah. even got to go deep on it. I just just give us the cup, couple bullets. I mean, points. the scoop is, is that around that time I was ollieing off vert ramps at demos as the ending trick, and I was ollieing off stuff over twelve feet regularly to flat, and that is as far as I'd gone. Saw that thing, saw that spot, or saw that gap, not even a gap over a rail. Saw that spot, and thought. I don't know if I could ride away from this, but I know I could land on the board. So I um, went there a couple times, didn't pull the trigger, finally was there, ready to do it, tried it once, wasn't going fast enough, feet dropped off the board, feet shifted on the board when they dropped off, broke the board, and didn't want any more. And then I wanted to go back, but I had a series of injuries after that that lasted about five years. And then I just kind of lost my drive to thinking that that was like – that was not my motivating factor was going back and proving myself. I had so many other things that I wanted to do and dreaming about. So prove just never, yourself to yourself kind just, of thing. No, I would have gone and done it to try and like, you know, be famous, shock the world, do yeah. something, do something that's never been done. Jump off the highest thing ever. I like to admit that now. Yeah. I mean, you, know? you did. I tried it. Yeah, yeah. And I get a lot of credit. I, you know, I think that I get undue credit because you're trying it. it. Not just because I didn't land it. I only tried it once. Yeah, that's anybody not even Anybody can fair. try. Anybody that's not can. Even a fair assessment. Anybody can try anything once, you know. And sure, I had the balls to try it before anybody had jumped off anything that high. I, I see it. I see the credit in that, but it's not. It's not worth hanging around for 
25 years and people still acting like it's a great feat. That's in my opinion. Yeah. Did, did Bart Simpson make it? Because I did see that. He made photo. it. He made, he made it. it. He, okay. He stuck it. Bart Simpson stuck it. But there's also a legendary site. You rolled up and your name was written on the rail or some shit? Yeah, that was the weirdest that's part. Misty. That's a yeah, misty that's shit. Crazy. So I was at the school by my, or I was at the school with a group of guys and I was looking at it, rolling up to it. They left and I was by myself. I rolled up to it with the speed I thought you would go just to like speed check it and kicked my board into the rail and put my hand on the rail and I saw there was words on the rail and moved my hands and it said Jamie M. Thomas Gap. And I was like, I'm sitting here eyeing it up. This person already thought it. Serendipity. Let's do this. We're going to do it. Before you hit it, it said that. Yeah, yeah. That's What's the M wild. stand for? In Jamie? Matthew. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so quick, quick little story. It's biblical based, but my mom was supposed to have a surgery to get her tubes tied and to not be able to have any more kids. My dad didn't want any more kids. Um, I'm the youngest of four. So after the third, you know, whatever, some years after the third, they were planning on not having any more kids. And, you know, apparently back then it was the woman's job to sort that out, not the man's as it is nowadays, um, unless it's convenient um, or the opportunity presents itself. But um, at any rate, my mom got the flu and couldn't get the operation and postponed it two months and then got pregnant in those two months. So she felt like I was a gift from God, and she named me James Matthew Thomas, which is three of the 12 disciples. Um, so that's my name, super biblical. I didn't have any clue about that when I was a kid, and I went by Jamie, which was, you know, I don't know, a fast, young, cheeky version of James. So uh, whatever. That's the story. Now you go by the chief. <laughs> 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 I don't introduce myself as the chief. You should. I'll tell you what. If I was you, I would yeah. be like, how's it going? I'm the chief. You know, you doing? I'm practicing humility these days, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to call you the chief. I think we did it, the chief. And um, I, I'm, chief. I'm really excited about this convo. Yeah, that was incredible. And we want to thank you for coming on the show, uh, saying your piece. And I learned a lot today. Yeah. So. Awesome. Um, I've actually started snowboarding recently. Yeah, that's no actually way. another oh, question yeah. I want to ask. I figured you just did snowboarded. You did, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so I went snowboarding in 1993 with Tony Hawk and a couple of other cats. Dave Bergthold, the guy who ran Blockhead and, the, and Invisible, the company I rode for at the time. We got tr passes from Transworld because Transworld was right next to the company I rode for. They had, like, full kits. You just went in and tried on boots, grabbed a board. They had lift, lift passes, and we went up to Big Bear. And I think I went twice. First time I was just, you know, getting on, I was on my ass all day, figuring it out. Second time, thought I had it figured out, tried to jump. Big Bear, you know, it's a little bit uh, warm and icy at times. And so um, I don't even know if warm has anything to do with icy, but there was some icy patches. I tried to jump a jump, hit my chin, knocked myself out, and was like, yeah, I think I'm going to chill on Second this. Second day snowboarding. Second day snowboarding. It was like the... It was like a month later from the first visit. And I was feeling pretty good before that. And then I was like, you know what? This I probably should either take time to really learn how to do this properly or just, you know, drop the mic. And I dropped the mic and didn't go back until my kids were like, oh, we want to go to the mountains. We want to go to the mountains. And so I called the snowboard people I knew. And Alex, Andrew was, Alex Andrews was the most helpful. He linked me up with the marketing dudes at um, – at Mammoth and a Big Bear, and um, they uh, paved the way for you know me to get out there and start s snowboarding. And you're liking it now, the second time. Around. You know what? I just don't take myself so serious yeah. now. Now I just cruise, man, and enjoy it, and just yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you think people are gonna be like, oh, Jamie's gonna be ripping, no, one, yeah, gonna that's ruin that your experience. that day is long gone. Yeah, how's the no. back three? People don't even think it. People don't even think. I do back three slides. They're dope. Yeah. Dope. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you slide around on the snow? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The I'm, kids I'm liking it too? You know, I haven't, I've probably gone snowboarding seven times now in my adult life. So it's enough to cruise and enjoy it. And I, I do little jumps here and there. And I like, I board slid some boxes the last oh, time I was out. Oh, you boardies. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I wanted to front board. I front board a little bit, but it was a little like, I kind of stayed a little crooked. Yeah, um, 45'd it. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. 45'd it. Yeah. Zeached. And yeah. I'm I'm pretty much learning with my kids. My 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 oldest is he gets down the mountain way faster than I do, a lot more fearless, you know. 
And um, my 12 year old, I pretty much hang with him. Me, he, me, he and I are snow buds. My so wife too. My wife's doing it. My daughter's doing it. And so it's just, it's a super, it's just one more thing we can do as a family. You know, our kids are 12, 14, 16, so they can do anything now. So we like, you know, going up, being in the mountains and, um, yeah, it's, uh, so you're going to continue doing it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's fun. We go to the mountains, like, I don't know, three, four times a season now. And, um, you know, bear, we can get to in a day easily. And, you know, Clayton like rolls out the red carpet for us and takes care of us. And then Gabe at mammoth does the same. And it's been amazing, man. Like to be able to have those relationships and just kind of hit them up and, one time Clayton, they had like an event where they were having like a Facebook live event and they were trying to get like local pseudo celebrities, like action sports celebrities to come up. And me and Rob Machado went up and rode the mountain for a day. And it was so cool, you know, and to also like to not have any expectations and to have nothing to prove is just fun. I can like, you know, just go with my wife and we just seeing each other smiling, you know, and just enjoying being outside, you know, it's rad, man. And it's cool to discover it later in life where, I'm not such a purist about skating and, you know, it's kind of just like, I'm just here for a good time, man. And here to like, you know, watch the family cruise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just enjoy it. Talk about what we did in the day. Talk about what was fun. Talk about what we learned. We've had a few situations because both of those spots don't really have good cell phone service where we get broken up as a family. And that's been a little stressful, you know, like our youngest got totally stranded one time and it was, it was a bummer. It was my fault, but, um, I kind of just forgot what I was doing and just, just like in the moment. And then he, we were out on opposite paths and we couldn't link back up. That's, that's tough. But anyway, snowboarding's a blast, man. And I'm, I'm ha- happy to discovered it later in my, in my uh, life. So love hearing that. Yeah, I want to, so I want to cool. see the chief coming down, just kind of back 50 in one of the big King rails one of these years, just kind of putting <laughs> it up. I don't know that I ever will do that. I, I don't, don't got no, I don't got beef like that. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I got, it really comes down to like when I was young, I had a lot to prove. Now I don't what have anything to prove. What if you're riding through the park and your song from, <laughs> <laughs> let's say you're cruising in Mammy. You're going down. Okay. <laughs> uh, we don't really call it Mammy, but now we do. Now we do. Um, and the speakers are blaring and your song from Welcome to Hell comes on. Dude, I think you're putting up a back 50 on the big dogger. Maybe a boardy. What do you think? I think I'm I'm getting goosebumps that I skated to that song one time and I'm enjoying myself and I just keep rolling down the hill with the biggest smile on my face. Okay. And I go right past the rails. I think that's oh, a smart move. Okay. Yeah. I'm right. not trying to get hurt out here. I'm trying to enjoy the whole weekend with my family. What about pow days? You get any pow days up there at Mammoth? At Mammoth, yeah, a little bit, but I'm kind of a wuss to the cold. I'll be honest uh, with you guys because I'm not used to it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I grew up in 100 degree, 100 degree weather with gnarly humidity. Mm. And when it gets real cold, that lift sucks. It does. I don't complain much. I don't talk about it out loud. I'm in complain. I'm complaining in my head big time. Which is nice for the kids, though. Not to they say suffer in so silence. That's what the Navy SEALs say. Suffer yeah, in silence. Yeah. I suffer in silence, and I also. After one of those days, I planned for it from that point on. I got the glove liners. I got the face the face mask, the neck mask. I got a couple of undershirts in the locker. Better to be overprepared. Yeah, you, absolutely. You live in SoCal. You live in a cold place. You just naturally get kind of immersed to it. You're, I just, yeah. yeah, I feel like I'm just not, I'm not, um, I haven't, I haven't uh, explored that level of mental toughness for cold weather. I've explored it for hot weather. I can go in the south it's brutally hot and brutally humid and I'm comfortable in it. And I know what that feels like. And most people are complaining like crazy mm-hmm. and they hate it. Um, but I, I find comfort in that. So I know I, I could imagine. Buds wouldn't get, do that. Buds would not do well. No, I don't do well in the heat. He, cold, he runs hot. He's like, look over here. He's pouring sweat. It's in here. We got a crank. Snowboard <laughs> photographer too. I'm just used to the cold. Yeah. You're just sitting. You're, like, you're like a, you're like a polar bear. You know, yeah. you got to wear gloves. You know what he could teach you too. He, he believes that a dirty lens is the technique. He, it's like a, it's like a cauldron <laughs> effect. You should see the amount of dirt on his fish eye. When you shoot a photo, he believes it's in not cause I've been shooting for, 20 some odd years, man. It's you know, the pot that, that gets all the that seasoning, old. you know, like a cauldron. That's how his lens a walk. is a walk, yeah. Seasoned gets better with time. With he the likes to think, a hot pot, yeah. It's like yeah. a hot, it's he like likes a hot to pot. tell people my lenses are dirty. There's yeah, so no, I see this. I see <laughs> that. I see he's, he's taking great joy in yeah, it. Yeah, it takes great but, joy. But I'm feeling, I'm feeling for you, I'm empathetic for you that Thank if you. I was a photographer, I would not want someone to be telling me that and acting like it's okay to be saying it like that. Yeah, see that, bro. 
What you don't He's want got me to, my back? Do you want me to not make fun of your lens being dirty anymore? Well, it's, I get a lot of stuff published, so I'm not that worried about it. Yeah, you can shoot it. Yeah, so you ever heard that? Like, if it doesn't, if it doesn't apply, let it fly. Yeah, yeah. It's you had a dirty lens. You had a dirty lens once or twice, and he's holding you to it. I probably never even had one. He's oh just, yeah, I've seen that thing. Out there. Are you kidding? When we're shooting, and look at that thing. Like, <laughs> that's just on your days. Yeah. Yeah, that's, he's not that important. So it's like, what abs, bro? Yeah, the B team. We keep the B team. That's the B, B team, team lens. He takes that one out. For the A-listers, he takes out the crispy fish ad. That's just immaculate. He likes so. to throw it around about my age, too. Yeah, like, How old are you? The same age he, as you. He was actually born before electricity. Uh, he loves like to Thomas do this. And Edison he's just era. waiting because soon his career is going to expire. <laughs> With the, his age is yeah, creeping. And he's, he's hanging on to the last, he's like... Hanging on. I'm projecting. I'm projecting. <laughs> projecting. Yeah. Preparing That's what I do. I come time. on here and I project. <laughs> How old are you? Um, well, I don't really want to disclose. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. <laughs> He's, he, that's age. where he's at. You know, he's I at kinda, the age where he can't tell people how old he is. I still want to get a couple more contracts signed. I don't want the team manager to be watching this being like, oh, shit. The smartest moves a lot of snowboard pros have done is they start early by saying they're younger than they are. They probably do that in skating, too. No, I don't know anybody that does that. I've met a couple snowboarders who have done that. Yeah. How old are you? And they just start younger than they are right from a young age. That's a pro tip. Yeah. That is a pro tip. tip I'm not going to out a, a couple people who have done it, but <laughs> yeah, I, I've seen it. I never – it is what it is, It is man. what it is. It yeah. is what it is. You're and, only and, as old as you are and feel. Yeah, and this face looks a certain age. It's, I've, <laughs> it's, it's experienced life, and I couldn't even try and start lying about that. that yeah, this wouldn't make sense. Yeah, a couple Baja miles on there. I mean, you need them. to start – you need to start reading your stuff here. You got to live authentically. <laughs> so the, for the, you got to live authentically. What he's referring to is a quote we have that faces us. It says, "I don't know the key to success, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody." Let me tell you something. I'm not trying to please everybody by not saying my age. I'm just trying to get re-signed by a couple people. You know what I mean? So True. It's, it's not everybody. <laughs> Damn. All right, all right. Well, I'm 33. Okay, <laughs> there it is. Whoa, that's young, man. Yeah, that's young. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, is we'll it? see. Yeah, some, that's young. Yeah. yeah I'm, that, that, I'm, that, old, I'm in an no. old head sandwich okay. over here, though. <laughs> yeah. You put yeah, me next that, to an 18-year-old. That's then. fine. No, that, no, no, still. Even still, <laughs> even still, that's young. And the reason that's young is, is that you're at the point now where you understand the pitfalls. Yeah. And you can be as productive as a young buck because you know all the things not to do and you have your system in place. Like, that's prime time right there. You talk to Jeremy Jones. He's saying, like, that was it for him. Like, you give him that 30 to 37, like, that was it. He was firing because he knew he knew the ropes. He knew what he needed to do. He knew how to get it done. I agree with it. Can you say that to my team managers in my contract? <laughs> you write that I, think I, I, think, I think I just did. <laughs> I think he just did. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, well, man, I think it's been a fun one. I, I think we did it. You got anything else you want to talk about? Um, no, man. Thanks for coming. Man. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm hyped. I'm hyped. We did this. I Me appreciate too. it. I mean, it's pretty deep. You go and listen to any of my interviews in the last little pace of piece of time. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm on that, I'm on that, uh, that gratitude, uh, trajectory and I'm, I'm okay with that. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Well, all you guys listening, watching, we appreciate you guys speaking to gratitude uh, and you know what? We'll see you next week. We got another one coming at you. Thank you for tuning in over and out from the bomb hole. Ooh.